Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my, my name is Ali Jalilian. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you all uh, this morning. Uh, for us this morning and, a, and night for some of you. So uh, wherever you are, hope you're all doing well. So this morning I'm going to share with you um, some thoughts and some a review basically on the current thought process and management of uh, chemical injuries, both for short-term and long-term. I have no financial disclosures related to this uh, talk. So, again, as you know, uh, chemical injuries can lead to severe uh, destruction on the surface of the eye, and is one of the true uh, medical emergencies in the eye immediately after it takes place. So um, interventions are necessary to try to minimize the complications, both in immediate and, and short and long term. And, and obviously, as you know, uh, epidemiologically, this is more, more common in males age 20 to 40, but obviously it could happen at any age. So the common offending agents, um, Chemicals that are used for cleaning um, are, are a common cause, whether both at home and in industrial settings. Uh, this, for instance, is a sulfuric acid, um, but battery explosion. I've seen patients in um, alkali acids, both can be quite uh, destructive. And as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the severity of the destruction obviously uh, depends on a number of factors, the, the pH, um, and then the concentration, the volume, the temperature, the time the surface gets exposed to these chemicals. Um, all of these can affect uh, the severity um, of the damage to the surface of the eye. So again, um, a quick word about alkali injuries versus uh, acid injuries. Um, alkali, in general, as you all know, are much, can cause much more severe damage because they can penetrate the tissues more, um, while acidic substances uh, won't be able to penetrate as much. Um, given that it causes uh, coagulation of the proteins. However, having said that, I think a point to remember is both acid and alkali can cause very severe damage. So in, in the acute setting, really you treat them both the same. Uh, and I've seen just as bad um, ha things happen with, uh, with acidic injuries. Um, but the good part is that the penetration's less uh, with with acid, but nonetheless, the surface complications are pretty pretty comparable. So acutely, this is one of my patients. This is actually a uh, combined chemical and thermal injury from, uh, and this, this actually came off is off the screen here, but it's from fireworks injury, which is not too long ago here in the U.S. We had the annual fireworks uh, festival, um, but the, the findings, this is a, a pretty severe injury, again, uh, which also affected the skin and the periorbital area, uh, which can happen in these settings, but often in a severe injury, there's quite a bit of chemosis here. You can see um, a lot of white tissue, basically white ischemic uh, tissue here. The cornea is quite hazy and edematous. Um, and again, we can't really see much further here, but uh, there can be other findings inside the eye. There can be sometimes a cataract and a very severe injury that penetrates the eye further. Um, obviously, so this patient, again, when you stain this patient, you see no epithelium. There's like the total loss of epithelium. So these are these are these severe grade injuries. But again, you could have varying degrees of epithelial defects. Um, 
So some other findings, like we said, cataract can indicate penetration of the, of the chemical. Um, high IOP, again, this is this sometimes it can be again damage or inflammation in trabecular meshwork. We'll talk more about the IOP, and, uh, and then in very severe cases, it can be damage to the retina. It's mostly uh, immune mediated. So in those very severe alkali injuries, there's you can have posterior damage. Okay, so uh, quick question. Uh, what is the most important prognostic factor immediately after ocular chemical injury? Corneal conjunctival defects, chemosis, conjunctival inflammation, and uh, limbal ischemia. Okay, great. All right, so 95% limbal ischemia. That's great. Good, good. So we do have a very experienced group here. So uh, we can go through some of the basics more quickly. Um, all right, so again, the, the severity of limbal ischemia, which was basically, and you can see, and this will be as basically white, whitening of the tissue uh, because of all the vessels and all the structures of the vessels have been dis destroyed as part of the injury. That ischemia is the uh, is a major prognostic factor. And that's really the, um, again, here you can see quite extensive uh, limbal ischemia here. We'll talk about grading in a second, so that, that degree of limbal ischemia really uh, is the form, forms the basis of these uh, grading schemes to, uh, to determine the severity of injury. Grade one has no limbal ischemia and just limited uh, corneal epithelial damage. Grade two has a little bit of corneal haze and less than one third limbal uh, ischemia. Grade three has total loss of the epithelium uh, stromal haze, and one-third to one-half limbal ischemia, and then grade four, which has the poor prognosis, the really cornea is somewhat mostly opaque, and more than a half uh, of the limbal ischemia. Now, and that's the Roper Hall classification. Uh, Dr. Dua also has uh, come up with another classification, which goes from one to six, and basically, the main difference is that it breaks down the, the limbal involvement into the number of clock hours, one, one to two, two to three, three to four, or four. Um, and that is just since there, there's a bigger jump in the other classification. But I still tend to use that original one, the grade one to four for uh, most of my patients. So a typical example, so this would be a grade two uh, type of injury. They can see the uh, ischemia here. It's less than a third. There's some corneal haze. Um, and this would be probably more like a grade uh, three or possibly four, depending on what's happening superiorly. Okay, so in terms of pathophysiology, there are different types of events that are taking place. Um, in the acute setting, really, let's say the first, there's an acute phase uh, in the first seven days. Then there's an early repair phase, seven to 21 days, and then late repair beyond 21 days. And these, I mean, these days are somewhat arbitrary. It's plus or minus, uh, let's say, 10, 20% on each of those numbers. Uh, so we divide the management and how we're going to discuss it today in the talk into immediate. Uh, acute and chronic, and acute being the first six weeks and chronic being beyond six weeks. So um, again, it looks like we have an experienced group here mostly, so the management of the immediate phase is, uh, goes without saying that it's irrigation uh, as quickly as possible with, the, uh, with an aqueous solution that can be obtained as quickly as possible, and oftentimes that's going to be water or tap water. Um, then um, followed by, obviously, irrigation when they present to the 
uh, emergency room or to the clinic uh, setting. Um, so these patients again, um, so we have again experienced group here, but this, this protocol for treating patients with chemical injury when they walk through the door should already be established, really should have everything ready, should have to, to scramble to try to find things to, to get patients going. So you wanna start irrigating them immediately, not waste time taking history and um, put an anesthetic in to start um, irrigating right away. Um, a, this should be can use instead of us. Um, can use a Morgan lens and we'll show you what that looks like and start with at least irrigating for at least a couple liters and checking pH until you get to about seven and a half. Uh, so this, this slide again is from the Morgan lens manufacturers. Um, there could be other variations of this and I have obviously no financial interest in this, but basically it's a, it's a plastic lens type uh, that sits on the eye and allows, and it gets hooked to an IV bag and you can irrigate uh, continuously and, uh, and makes, facilitates the process, makes it easier. So uh, again, as you know, the, um, it's also important to really sweep the fornices, both lower and upper for any particulate matter or sort of pockets of uh, chemicals there. Uh, the patients wear a contact lens, remove their contact lens, which could also be another reservoir of the chemical. So the uh, management of the immediate phase, like we said, really tap water as quickly or water as quickly as you can in the field. It is, it is hypotonic, so it does cause some, some corneal swelling. Um, probably the most readily available are gonna be these uh, isotonic solutions that are used for IV fluids and among this normal saline or lactated ringers, and lactated ringers is probably preferred just because it has some buffering capacity. Uh, and so that probably is our first choice. Buffered solutions really are not, probably not the ideal, especially if you have this. Um, and then this, these amphoteric solutions, which have higher buffering capacity, these are have been developed specifically, but again, there's, there seems to be some data that maybe these may have a slight advantage over the uh, other lactate ringers, uh, for instance, but probably in the long run doesn't make much difference, but the problem is that these are not readily available, and you, so, but if it's right away available, then, then obviously you could go with this um, besides the, <laughs> the other options. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the acute phase, beyond the immediate phase. Uh, so this is like a question beforehand, which one is not the, one of the main objectives uh, during the acute phase, after the immediate phase, in the management of ocular chemical injury? Decrease inflammation, avoid further epithelial and stromal breakdown, foster reepithelization, and copious irrigation. Okay, so, I think I didn't phrase this question properly. I wanted to find out which one of these is not an important par part of our uh, acute management following the immediate. Um, so the immediate the treatment is copious irrigation. Then the next, then following that, starting that first, starting immediately in the first couple of weeks, really these, these first three are what we're gonna do the first three and the copious irrigation. So this was a not question, not a very well worded question, but anyway, we'll, we're gonna discuss these here. Okay, so during the acute phase, now we're saying starting from immediate, after, from after the immediate to the first six weeks or so, really uh, the major goal of our treatments are to decrease inflammation, avoid further epithelial loss and stromal breakdown, and foster reepithelization. So uh, we published an algorithm uh, uh, in a review paper, and I can share that with, uh, with the audience later on if they like. Um, and the ascending of acute English after irrigation, then really these are the, the steps we're gonna take to control inflammation, 
promote reabsorption, prevent infection, and prevent stromal breakdown. And then we're going to talk about all the components here, basically what, uh, what are involved. So, okay, so I saw that this steroid is a, is a really is a key question that uh, a lot of people also have a question about steroids. And we're going to spend some time talking about steroids. But just again, beforehand, we'll throw questions at you guys. Which steroid uh, timing and regimen is most appropriate after chemical injury? Immediately before irrigation, start with mild uh, steroid drops. Start after irrigation, steroid drops every hour for the first 10 to 14 days. Wait until the cornea is re-epithelialized, then use it four times a day. Start steroids only if there's inflammation and start with the lowest dose. So which of these sounds would be most appropriate? Okay, great, yeah, perfect. So this that's what the one that I had in mind was the um, start after irrigation every hour for the first 10 to 14 days. Um, so we'll talk about that and then what to do after that. So why are we using so much steroids? What's the rationale? And the rationale obviously is that, that when you have such massive tissue destruction, you're gonna have massive inflammation. And that, that inflammation itself is gonna cause even more destruction. So what we're trying to do is to stop or reduce that, that surge of inflammation, particularly neutrophils. You get a massive infiltration with neutrophils uh, within that first week. So you really give them very intense steroids. And here we use prednisolone acetate as our strong steroid that's easily available, but uh, any other equivalent potent uh, steroid, dexamethasone or things like that are, are fine. And you use them every hour for an injury that's grade two or higher. Um, so now the question of the steroids, as you know, they're great medication, but they, they come with uh, at a cost. And, and the problems here that we run into are that steroids can inhibit epithelialization, they can inhibit collagen synthesis, um, they can help, and because of that, help contribute to melts. Um, so, so the standard really uh, teaching is to, to stop the steroids or really after the first 10 to 14 days. So, and I would say, so a key determining factor here is the epithelial defect. So if you still have an epithelial defect at two weeks, and those are gonna be the more severe injuries, then definitely you have to back off your steroids considerably. However, if your epithelium has healed by two weeks, then you're really, you're safe to continue using steroids um, as much as you th think it's indicated. And I'd still, I'd be hitting them pretty hard with steroids, maybe not every hour, but you can back off to every two or three hours. But, but once you have an ep a persistent a epithelial defect that's persisted uh, up to beyond two weeks, then you have to back off your steroids and I typically back off to probably no more than three or four times a day. So I mean, keep, that's just because these, the risks of uh, contributing to a melt, and that, that has been shown in previous studies. So other things that we can do to sort of augment our uh, anti-inflammatory uh, therapy is systemic steroids. And typically these patients in severe injuries, I'll start with one milligram per kilogram uh, right away in the first, uh, in that first day uh, of presentation, and keep them on it at this level for at least a week or two, then start to, to bring it down, uh, taper over that first month or so. Um, again, just a minor point that, again, patients who are gonna have chronic prolonged inflammation, then I have used uh, agents such as azathioprine or mycophenolate, but again, really it's hard to know. There's really no studies to, to say one way or another, but. But in general, the more you can suppress inflammation, uh, the more you can prevent the long-term sequelae or reduce the long-term sequelae. So, so, and why is it that, that you get melts in this setting? Obviously, it seems, seems obvious that the, because there's been so much destruction on the surface, there's really not much 
viable cells in the stroma. You don't have, you have hardly any living keratocytes or in the stroma. So once this, uh, and when you have such massive infiltration of inflammatory cells, and such as neutrophils, who are dumping a lot of matrix methylproteinases, they're gonna start digesting the tissues and you have nothing there, there are no cells there to start repairing it. <clears throat> so that's why in this setting, we try to do anything we can also, to, uh, things like tetracyclines, which have M MMP inhibiting activity, uh, ascorbic acid or vitamin C to help promote collagen synthesis. Um, these, these two for sure I do use, we'll talk about doses in a minute. And then these citrate or acetylcysteine and cysteine, uh, protein, I, I don't use uh, in, in this setting, but they've been, this citrate certainly some people use, uh, but just not, not as easy to get. Uh, so the tetracycline uh, class of drugs, whether it's tetracycline itself uh, or um, doxycycline or minocycline, which are, has a BID dosing, it's easier than tetracycline, it's QID. Um, that will start in all of these chemical injury patients, vitamin C, uh, several grams a day. Um, like I said, citrate also from people use, but I don't, I haven't used it, just not, not easy to get. <clears throat> so, so promoting epithelization. So that was, uh, that was controlling inflammation. Now we have to try to promote epithelization. And obviously that's, uh, it's critical. The faster you can get the epithelium to heal, the faster you'll stop the risk of melt and other, other potential complications. So prophylactic antibiotics uh, I use, but we don't have to use the most potent antibiotics. I, uh, I typically use something like erythromycin ointment several times a day. Um, but these other agents, like chloramphenicol, which may be available to many of you, probably just as good. Um, I would and I would avoid medications that have more some toxic or a little bit toxic to the epithelium, like the, um, gentamicin. So we use a self bandage lens in pretty much all these patients to help uh, help with epithelialization. Now, and if you have a persistent defect that's not healing, then scleral lenses may be an option to think about. Uh, once you get into that sort of chronic phase, uh, large diameter scleral lenses. But again, this depends on having enough, a, first, this being available, uh, just because it, it requires expertise to fit these, so it, it does require some time to get the right fit, but also um, have to have a good enough fornix uh, to get this into the eye. Either way, I think this, this has a role in the chronic phase. Uh, acutely with the soft bandage lenses. So, so amniotic membrane, <clears throat> and I think most of you are probably familiar with this. It, um, its most important effect, it, it acts like a biological bandage contact lens. So it's a sort of alternative to using a hydrogel contact lens. So it, uh, this is one sort of contact lens-like device that, um, and I have no financial interest in the Procura, but, <clears throat> but you, don't have to, you don't have to have, this just makes it easier to put in and out. Um, it's advan it, it does offer advantages here, <clears throat> I think, um, and that amniotic membrane also does have anti-inflammatory effects as well, so basically it's acting like a <clears throat> sponge, let's say, for trapping neutrophils and uh, um, and other uh, inflammatory cytokines. <clears throat> um, and I would say <clears throat> for injuries up to grade three, um, for sure it it can it can improve, or I'd say it can accelerate your uh, epithelialization and uh, and it's been studied that it can also reduce uh, pain in these patients. But for the very severe grade, grade four, probably doesn't make much difference because so much tissue has been lost and, and destroyed. So probably doesn't, it, it still cannot 
lead to epithelization during that one or two weeks that this membrane lasts. That, that's still not long enough for epithelium to heal or to epithelium to start to come back in these patients. Anyway, so I would say <clears throat> the most appropriate place to use it would be in a severe grade two or grade three injury. Uh, and the way to use it, and basically you're, um, for most of you, this something like this will not be available. So, I, and I would say you suture it to the, to the surface of the eye. This, this was here was a persistent epithelial defect. So this is not, this is a little bit different. This is more of in the chronic phase. A, a patch graft was placed here. Then, um, or I should say a graft was placed here. Then this, the membrane was placed over the whole, th whole cornea as a um, patch. And some people would even go and line the uh, the rest of the epithelial surfaces, the conch and the bulbar surface. Um, and there's not much downside to it, but I'm not sure that it really makes a big difference. Um, but anyway, we can talk more about this through questions at the end. Um, other things that people can use to try to speed up epithelization. Uh, again, we don't routinely use these right away, but if the defect has persisted for several weeks, we'll start a patient on autologous serum. Uh, PRP or platelet plasma is also another alternative. Uh, really no studies comparing these head to head to say one is better than the other, but maybe this, this the PRP is, has more, um, more rich uh, growth factors. Um, but either way, both are good options and really very little downside to them, just other than difficult to get and you have to have a, a way to, to make it or someone make it for you. Uh, so there was a question on tarsorophy, so I threw the slide in here and we'll talk more about it. Tarsorophy really doesn't have much role in that acute phase. Still, We're still discussing the acute phase, but definitely in the chronic phase, we have a persistent of their defect that persisted beyond two or three months. Um, then for sure it has a role. Um, and, but again, if you have a patient that I have a patient that has adequate fornix and the scleral lens is readily available, I'd probably try that before Tarsor. But nonetheless, I've dealt with uh, epithelial defects that have persisted for many months, three, four, five months after the injury. Uh, and the only thing that I finally got it to heal was uh, the Tarsorophy. So, um, Another question on the management here during the acute phase, which one of the following pitfalls or let's say mistakes, if we should call them, or oversights uh, is more serious during the management uh, of a chemical injury during the acute phase? Not using artificial tears or lubricants, not following the IOP and trochlear pressure, not using amniotic membrane, or not using a bandage contact lens. Which of these is the most could be most serious. Yeah, great. So again, not following the IOP really is is definitely um, is definitely an important part of our management of these patients because and it's easy to overlook that because you're so focused on the surface that you lose sight of the fact that the IOP could be going up. So these patients need their IOP checked every single visit, and usually you're seeing the patients. Uh, at least twice a week during this, uh, twice or three times a week during this uh, first couple weeks. Um, so just, that's, that's just so that we don't forget that. Again, I have to remind myself also about that. Okay, so t plasty basically the idea here is that when you have so much necrotic uh, tissue, including necrotic t and really not much in this, in this picture, I'll discuss this in a minute. Um, in those cases, you want to excise a lot of that necrotic tissue. So that's going to be in the setting when there's extensive limbal ischemia. A lot of your sub subconjunctival sartenans tissue could become necrotic. Again, not here. I mean, this tissue is obviously nice and viable. But again, if if this whole area looked like this, you'd have some necrotic tenons uh, there. So excising that may help reduce inflammation and then you could pull healthier tissue over. So that the idea is that to try to, if you can, bring, uh, bring vessels up to the cornea, bring tissue, bring some viable tissue closer to the cornea and all those necrotic areas to help 
or ischemic areas to help uh, help promote healing. Um, so, and that, that you can combine it with, with amniotic membrane transplant if you want it, or, or with patch grafting. Um, um, so I'll tell you what, what we did in this case, uh, this, this patient actually, this, this area persisted as a defect for, I can't remember exactly, but some, at least a month, month or six weeks out, still had a persistent uh, conductival defect and we were worried about uh, a melt or anything like that. So what we did basically went and, and that any necrotic sort of tissue that was there was removed, but then we advanced uh, tissue from surrounding area uh, to try to help close that defect and bring viable tissue here. So we basically brought some congentinons, uh, advanced it over here, and this patient did, uh, did quite well, and it healed within, within a week or two after that. Okay, so to sum up our uh, summary of our uh, management in the acute phase. Um, and this just shows the sort of level of evidence and sort of what in terms of studies. It's, it's tough to do really randomized control studies for these kinds of conditions. Just not enough patients and too, too variable. But anyway, there, there's good evidence from different uh, studies to, to support many of these, many of the things that we're doing. Uh, so steroids, tetracycline, um, vitamin C, many of these studies have really support those. Uh, bandage lens, I think, goes without saying. It can help uh, from, help with epithelialization. Um, amniotic membrane, as we talked about. Um, if you're going for the anti-inflammatory effect, then really, then you want to do it in that first week for sure. But otherwise, if you're doing it for to promote epithelialization, probably should be done, can be done later as well, uh, just because that takes a while for that epithelium to start moving. Um, Autologous serum, tenons, and then IOP, high IOP. So, okay. Now we're going on to the uh, management of the chronic phase. Uh, which one is the last surgical intervention that should be performed in chronic phase of ocular chemical injury? Keratoplasty, correction of eyelid abnormalities, management of glaucoma, ocular surface reconstruction, or transplantation. Okay. Um, great. Again, uh, probably not the best designed question here. Uh, what I was going for here was keratoplasty. In other words, not to jump to keratoplasty, but, but again, not the reason I, that was, a, so it was, the idea was to correct eyelids and glaucoma and surface reconstruction before you do a keratoplasty for vision. I should have corrected that. So, but you may have to do a tectonic keratoplasty because it's melting. So, so again, um, if you didn't get keratoplasty, it was more my fault for not really phrasing this question right. Okay, so the chronic phase can be challenging. Uh, and it, it requires m often multiple procedures to try to rehabilitate these surfaces, these eyes. But typically the order that we, um, we go with is they start with correcting eyelid issues, address the glaucoma, then you do surface reconstructions, limbal transplantation, uh, or conjunctival or, or rest restoration, Finally, keratoplasty uh, for vision. Um, so, and this is a patient who, again, this is a, uh, this patient only required just a limbal autograph. Uh, actually first required one step procedure for amniotic membrane and fornix reconstruction, followed by later with an autograph and has done quite well, uh, but didn't require any, anything else. It was, uh, due to a battery explosion. Um, so here's again our, um, again, this is the same thing. We, we published this algorithm uh, in the Ocular Surface Journal, but I can share this or, or the whole review with anyone who'd like. Um, the, I, basically talking about all the steps that we talk about, but specifically 
focusing more on the limbal stem cell deficiency, whether it's partial or total, and it's unilateral or bilateral, uh, and then so stepwise, which procedures we uh, we consider. So we're going to talk about all these steps. So really, the first step to think about is uh, is to fix their address their eyelid and eyelid and conjunctiva. Basically, they go hand in hand. So frequently, they're going to have extensive scarring and symblepharon. Uh, and before you can do anything for the cornea, you have to address those. And the um, and a good rule of thumb is that you want to wait for these eyes to quiet down. Doing surgery on a hot eye will often lead to sort of recurrent inflammation and scarring. So you want to quiet them down. And in fact, what I do sometimes in patients, I actually start them on something, start them on a systemic agent to help quiet them down. And that uh, my, the agent that I typically like to use is mycophenolate and have them on that for a couple months. Um, but um, I know at least one colleague, Dr. Charlie Bouchard, who, who has gone as far as putting him, again, these very severe injuries, these severe injuries to try to suppress their inflammation, has put him on uh, cyclophosphamide, uh, which is a pretty, um, it's, a, it's a major intervention. Those, that's a, the drug is a serious drug. Anyway, so the, controlling their immune system, is definitely uh, a part of the picture, part of the management. Okay, so for mild to moderate, moderate symblephron, which this really is not, but this one looks like it has a nice lower fornix or whichever lower that or upper it is, but this, this part is really shut. Uh, so um, the, the main steps of the surgery, again, we'll, we'll show a quick video here, uh, you excise tenons, but preserve conj, and you um, you can again mild to moderate cases just amniotic membrane to cover the defect, and definitely in all these cases you have to use mitomycin C. Um, let's see if this works here. So again, you can see here in the semblephron basically coming all the way up to the cornea. You start your incision right at the most anterior edge, sorry that this goes quickly here. I think I jumped right into, so the, so after this, after this dissection is complete, then you really, and I don't show this here very, in this video, it's, it's edited too, too much, but there's extensive tenons that has to be excised from here. So any tenons in that subconjunctival space you have to excise, you relax this Conge, so you let that fall back. You have to let it fall back as much as you can. So now you have the, then you take mitomycin C and you place it in that subconjunctival space deep towards the fornix, um, but it's in a subconjunctival space um, for that, basically treating any residual tenons that you did not excise. Um, and then So, and typically, so actually, I, you put more than I just would put in. You put uh, several pledgets of uh, mitomycin C, uh, 0.03 or 0.04 percent um, uh, for again, a good uh, three to four minutes. So then you cover your defect with amniotic membrane, and we use, um, for our amniotic membrane, we use fibrin glue uh, only. Uh, but you could suture these membranes, there's no, uh, no difference. And if you try to get the membrane to basically cover that bulbar surface all the way deep as much as you can. And then again, um, I don't show it here, but you, you also throw in a symblephron ring. That's very important for these fornix reconstructions. And, and I like to keep that ring in as long as possible. I mean, at minimum six weeks, but I mean, my preferred length of time is three to four months, because I think keeping that ring in definitely does help. Um, but the patients often don't like it, so you're, you're forced to take it out earlier. Now, in the most severe cases, uh, then really you don't have enough conch. And that, that patient that we just showed, that patient did uh, 
did extremely well. Sorry, I don't have post-op photos. Um, but again, that patient had partial limbal stem cell deficiency, so we'll tell, talk about it in a minute. But So I ended up not doing a limbal transplant, even though the other eye was, was healthy, and I just went in with a keratoplasty, um, and the patient did quite well. There was enough reserve on that eye. But, okay, going back to fornix reconstruction, for the most severe cases, you really need to bring new tissue, and in this case, obviously, as a, if it's a unilateral injury, you could get some conge tissue from the other eye, but for bilateral injury, a mucous membrane graft, a buccal mucosa or labial mucosa, and, uh, and really it's hard to reconstruct a severe uh, symblephron without that. Um, once you have a better fornix, once you've sort of gotten a better fornix, then really you want to make sure you address their, if, they're, if they have glaucoma and there are multiple medications, then you want to think about trying to address their glaucoma surgically. If there's enough conch tissue in the glaucoma, the surgeon feels comfortable putting a tube, uh, that, that's great. If not, then sort of cyclodestructive procedures. Either way, this will be a good time to, to address the glaucoma surgically. This is not a chemical injury patient. This is a limbal transplant patient, uh, KLAL. So we're going to spend the rest of the talk, uh, really the last sort of 10, 15 minutes talking about limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, which is really my, my really area of interest. And many of you are familiar with the manifestations, but bottom line is conjunctiva ends up growing over the conjunctiva, over the cornea. And you get vascularization, uh, cellular breakdown, stromal pacification. Uh, really, uh, these are all very visually devastating um, consequences of severe limbal stem cell deficiency. This patient's not a chemical injury patient. This, this is just, this is a different patient. This actually has some type of a, uh, it's actually a keratitis ichthyosis deafness syndrome, but these are all chemical injury patients. Okay, so uh, as long as you're here and everyone's here and we just, spend a minute just talking about how do you diagnose the most stem cell deficiency. So sometimes it's, I mean, obvious. I mean, like these cases, I mean, these are kind of vascularized panis growing over the cornea. Um, vessels are superficial as well as deep, but you, the superficial vessels is important because that's, that highlights kind of tabus. So stromal, Stromal neovascularization alone by itself is not a sign of the most stem cell deficiency. So sometimes in the case, let's like say like this, it's actually hard for me to know the, is there true limbal stem cell deficiency here or not. Here it's pretty obvious. I mean, you can see vessels are right on the surface, defect. It's, this is a clear limbal stem cell deficiency case. This one also. But again, even in this, I, it would be hard to know for sure how much so there may be, let's say, there could be some limbal stem cells here, a low possibility of this one, but really also this one without, sometimes it's hard to tell. And so the most useful test for diagnosing limbal stem cell deficiency for me is fluorescein staining. And, and the fluorescein staining really helps to bring out the conjunctival type epithelium versus corneal epithelium. <clears throat> so in this case, Again, this is not a chemical injury patient. This is a contact lens-induced limbal stem cell deficiency here. Uh, that this part of the cornea is staining differently from here. And you can see this nice demarcation line here. If you really zoomed in here, you'd see uh, this sort of a little bit of whirl pattern to this, uh, to this staining here. Um, so this late staining epithelium, now here you can see it more clearly. Again, this is also contact lens induced, just easier to see in these patients. Uh, so clearly corneal epithelium, clearly conjunctival epithelium. And then conjunctival epithelium is a little more opaque. So it's a patient with a chronic limbal inflammation uh, that had limbal stem cell deficiency, partial limbal cell. So again, you can see areas of opaque epithelium, areas of clear epithelium. So if you've stained this patient, these would stain, this area would not stain. So staining really is the most useful. And if you start, start, once you start looking at these patients after a while, it becomes pretty clear. But again, loss of palisades, uh, superficial vascularization, 
Uh, and these are all supportive evidence of the middle stem cell deficiency. But if you truly want to, if you really cannot determine, then you could take some piece of the surface, you know, compression cytology, or if you have access to confocal microscopy, those are other ways you could try to confirm it. So how you manage it in this setting or in general, it really depends on the, how severe it is and whether it's unilateral or bilateral. So for partial normal stem cell deficiency, which is not uncommon in the setting of a chemical injury, since sometimes the parts of the cornea are protected by the lids or you, don't, you may not get total loss of the uh, limbo stem cells. In those cases, Depends on, uh, again, whether the central cornea is involved, whether it's already not. And if it's not, obviously you just, you don't, you just observe it. Uh, lubrication, serum, top vitamin A, some steroids, these are kinds of things. So this, this, this combination, this number one, two, three here, this is what I use actually in any kind of a partial limbo stem cell deficiency where I'm trying to help support the limbus and those remaining limbal stem cells and maybe help them uh, expand or proliferate some more. So these are, this is pretty much all we have right now to, for those to, kind of, to offer those patients. But uh, once you, but if so, if you have, again, same thing, if you have central corneal involvement, I'd still start with this first, but if this is not doing it, then you can think of a, a surgical intervention, but often you don't want, you're not going for something very major uh, so this described by Dr. Dua, where you can scrape that epithelium away, uh, that conjunctival epithelium, which comes off very easily. Uh, you don't have to really scrape it. You just take a wax cell sponge, and it just sort of comes off just by gentle brushing. So that's a good way to, to distinguish conjunctiva from corneal ep uh, epithelial sheets on the cornea. You remove that, and you just keep doing that multiple times and try to give a chance for the other healthier corneal epithelium to grow in. Uh, or you could do this in a setting of surgery where you do a pyridomy, and this is a patient that I did where basically we did uh, pyridomy almost 360, not quite, but we basically let all this conj fall back, remove all this, and place amniotic membrane over this whole area. And again, you have, again, some, some improvement, but still, mm, you had, I mean, the patient really had at most just a couple clock hours of limbus left here, and even this wasn't that healthy either. So you still have some limbo stem cell deficiency up top here, but it's it's improved them to the point that they can they can see more see better through that eye. So obviously, the other alternative we'll talk about in terms of these unilateral partial cases is to actually redistribute the remaining stem cells. So this. So this remaining limbal stem cells here, you could try to take some piece, move it up top, or, or do a slit type technique, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so this is, these are, this is a list of all the procedures that we have available uh, for limbal transplantation. Uh, unilateral disease, you can take an autograft, or two autographs from the other eye, we'll talk about each of these. The cultured limbal epithelial cells, not readily available. Uh, and then the SLEX technique, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then bilateral disease, you can get tissue from a relative, cadaver, and then these other procedures. Again, we don't talk too much about them. But. So again, like we said before, before you start doing limbal transplantation, you definitely want to address all eyelid problems uh, beforehand. You have to get a good fornix and lephron repair. Now, sometimes we could combine some simblephron repair with uh, when you're doing kind of tidal limbal grafts. Uh, again, this patient did have some simblephron that which we addressed as part of their uh, limbal autograft from the other eye. Again, you can still see the, some parts of the graft here, but again, that you can you help the when you let the conch fall back, you help uh, reconstruct a better fornix for them. And this patient has done well now more than more than 12 years out. Uh, but this is the basic technique. You're taking a um, two pieces of about two clock hours from the fellow eye, and we we use basically just glue to secure these. But you can suture them or combine either way. Um, so slat. Okay. So I'm sorry, I don't have a a schematic or a diagram here. But basically, the idea again. This is another unilateral chemical injury. 
Um, limbal stem cell deficiency, you can see really some of the injury also caused some iris damage and ischemia here. Um, this patient took, uh, say, a good five, six months for their epithelium to heal. This patient had had a LASIK beforehand, that, that flap got necrotic. Anyway, so this patient uh, did a slat procedure with uh, pieces of tissue from the other cornea. I, I set the tissues a little more peripheral uh, so that they can leave this sort of central cornea a little more spare. Basically, the idea is to take a one clock hour from the healthy eye cut it into pieces, amniotic membrane over the whole eye, then cut it up into pieces and, and yes, uh, put it on there with glue. This was developed by the people at LV Prasad, uh, Render Sangwan, and, and Sayan Basu as an alternative to a um, chondrostomal limbo autograft. So I think it's a good technique, but the, the, some disadvantages of over an autograft, a traditional autograft that you do, brings some conjunctiva with you and helps you helps reconstruct the fornix when you have a fornix issue. So if you have fornix issues, then I probably prefer to uh, do a tr traditional limbal autograph. This patient didn't really have much fornix issues. The stromas were relatively clear. Again, if a patient that that you have uh, that had does not have enough clear stroma and you're bound to require a keratoplasty, my preference is to go with an autograph just because I worry about the Removing my tissues, these, these pieces of grafts as part of the keratoplasty, although they have shown that they, I guess, the midterm results, several, three or four years out, they, they seem to be doing okay, even after a keratoplasty. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to answer more questions about SLET at the end if you guys have some. So moving on to bilateral disease, then you really do need uh, to get tissue from someone else. Let's see if this video will start playing here. Uh, so again, this is not a chemical injury patient. This is a patient with aniridia that, again, we're taking, so we don't need as much conge here for this patient with aniridia. Um, so that's why I, I took smaller graphs and these graphs were taken from her sister. Uh, and this, um, so that's the basic idea, but again, with a chemical injury patient, you're gonna have a much bigger graph because you wanna bring as much conge with you uh, um, to try to reconstruct their surface with that additional live conjunctival. Because not many ways to really get conjunctival um, allograft tissue other than getting it from a living donor. The conjunctiva on the cadaver tissue is really often not, not viable. Anyway, so these have to be ABO match and HLA match as much as possible, depending on what's available. But a sibling that's Tissue matched is the ideal. If not, then you go with a parent or a child. Um, okay, and then limbal autograph, limbal allograph. Sorry, uh, using cadaver tissue. I think this uses a Holland's technique. We're using three pieces of tissue, but um, I now use just a just one single graph. But what I do, I do cut it right in one space, and that allow me to sort of dissect that tissue. Um, and again, I can share videos and, um, with people who are interested in learning more about this technique. But the key to success of this procedure is you have to have systemic immune suppression. Otherwise, this or even the other uh, living-related allograft uh, require uh, systemic immune suppression, oral steroids for a couple months, long-term use tacrolimus or cyclosporin. Uh, orally, again, or mycophenolate, or azathioprine, uh, either one. Uh, again, this this combination of medications. Again, these regimens have been published. I can share with people who would like to know. And again, the problem is, as you get, you're trying to avoid here is the rejection. Here you can see a rejection line. This patient several years out um, that developed rejection. Okay, um, another question here. Which of the following is not an important factor in preventing complications after limbal stem cell transplantation? Yeah, perfect. So um, basically, yeah, keratoplasty is really typically done afterwards unless you, um, unless you need it really for tectonic purposes. <clears throat> but a uh, good tear film makes a big difference. I mean, we'll talk about the very dry patients you can't really fix with limbal transplantation. 
proper, I mean, so we talked about all these. I'm just going to keep going here. So, um, so for optical reasons, then these patients can uh, benefit from a uh, transplantation with a penetrating keratoplasty or lamellar uh, if, you, if their endothelium is healthy. Um, and in some cases, like I said earlier, if, you, if they just have partial limbal stem cell deficiency, you, uh, that's not too extensive. You may, if you just get a healthy epithelium with a graft and do a uh, keratoplasty, that may be enough. They may not need additional surface procedures. So I've sometimes done that and I just said, okay, if they have problems, then I can always address that later on with an additional limbal graft procedure. But when you have near total uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, then really you have to do limbal transplantation, get a healthy surface before you do graft. And we definitely like to, to not do these as a combined procedures if we don't have to, we like to separate them out by several months. So keratoprosthesis, actually last couple slides here. Um, <clears throat> As you all know, the Boston keratoprosthesis is really Boston type 1 here, shown in the picture, is now um, the, the main capro that's available, although there are now other models that are becoming available. But the one with the longest track record is this one. Um, and this is really, um, I think it can be a, a great alternative to limbal transplantation or, uh, or in or sometimes combined together. Um, and all right, here's a quick question on this too. Which of the following is an ideal case for Boston type one K pro placement? Uh, and really these answers are not absolute, but I think it just gives you my th thought process. A 32 year old male without systemic disease and unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency 32-year-old female with type 1 diabetes and bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, 75-year-old male without any systemic disease and unilateral disease, and 75-year-old with type 2 and bilateral uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, which would be the best case scenario. But the kind of patient that I'd feel comfortable uh, putting in a K-Pro. Most feel, feel most comfortable with, let's say. None of these, it's a contraindication, but um, okay, so so let me, so I think I have to explain my thought process here. Basically, you know, the, um, I think with the answer that most of you chose, that first one is reasonable, uh, someone without systemic disease and unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency to put in a Boston k pro for that unilateral you know, That's not unreasonable, but, uh, and there may be patients who are hesitant to having the other eye touched for getting any kind of limbal autograft for that eye. So in which case, this, this would be a good, good, reasonable option. However, that's not the one that I was going for. The one that I was going for was this, this one, the 75-year-old female. And the reason is because this 34-year-old male is gonna be, it's gonna keep, First of all, it's a unilateral disease, so you have to argue whether, I mean, whether it's appropriate to do a K-Pro in a patient who already has one seeing eye. And is this, I mean, there's nothing, again, nothing wrong with it, but uh, it's patient choice whether they want to do that or not. But, um, but are they already, they're already seeing patient. This is the patient, bilateral disease, can't see, but the other problem is this 32-year-old is going to have to deal with this K-Pro for the rest of their life which could be another 60, 70 years um, of keeping that K-Pro in the eye. The 75-year-old uh, should, should have less. Let's say this time would be on the order of 20, 25 years or uh, in that range at most. So this would be a time frame that I think it's reasonable to think about a K-Pro staying in the eye. But again, 60 years to keep a K-Pro in the eye is long and we don't know if anyone has ever kept a K-Pro that long. It's been, it hasn't been around that long. Anyway, so in general, younger patients, I wouldn't push towards K-Pro. That's necessary. Older patients, more comfortable. So I have a young patient without systemic disease, even if they don't want to have limbal graft from the other eye, uh, either you don't do it or you could even think about getting some, uh, doing some cadaver-based tissue 
uh, if they're open to it. Uh, but again, it just depends on how comfortable you are with the procedures. So uh, obviously the patient has to be, has to understand the long-term risks, uh, lifelong follow-up, antibiotic prophylaxis. So a lot, a lot to talk about Kpro. I really won't go into it too much, but these patients with chemical injury, these are not the best of candidates either because they're, they're more prone to melts and extrusion just because the tissue is really not so viable. You don't have healthy uh, tissue surrounding the area. So that's why <clears throat> our, our preferred approach is to sort of often do a, a surface reconstructive procedures, obviously as part of their fornix reconstruction, maybe even, so bring some healthier tissue to the surface before you would consider doing a, an intervention like K-Pro. So I've never jumped to a K-Pro as a first procedure uh, unless it's really necessary, or unless I feel very confident in the health of their surface of their eye. But for sure, they need to get fornix reconstruction first because they're gonna have to get their contact lens in. So, a lot of complications, uh, fortunately not. I mean, they're less common, but they, they happen. If you do enough Cape Rose, you'll be seeing complications for sure. Um, all right, and glaucoma obviously needs to be addressed in these patients as well. So finally, just the last slide here, I guess, or one or two slides. So for the very severe dry patients, where the surface is keratinized, really none of the procedures we talked about really can work, and the uh, Osteodontal keratoprosthesis uh, or the type 2 Boston K-Pro are really the only options, but both of these really have issues and complications. And so, um, so we're still trying to get better um, at managing those patients. Okay, just this is again, sum up everything that we talked about for the chronic phase, fornix reconstruction, glaucoma, limbal stem cell deficiency, the different procedures. And then uh, in the end, uh, keratoplasty and keratoprosthesis. Okay, just want to leave you with a couple new ideas here. Um, so I think this is our last slide. So so the, de the toughest patients are these grade four, these severe, this is Roper Hall grade four, or let's say do all grade five, grade six patients. So much destruction on the surface. Really these patients, mm, they are at high risk for even getting perforations and melts really even in those for several months. So what can you do to try to help these patients? So some new ideas. Uh, this comes, this idea really was published by uh, Geetha Iyer at the Sankara Nathralia Hospital. And it's a great idea is to use some, what they're using is using some cadaver tissue, but you could even, if you don't have access to corneal tissue, you could even get a living relative and take a small biopsy, basically one, one clock hour, by basically doing an aloe slet in these patients. So an allograft based slet, put amniotic membrane over the whole surface, put pieces of uh, limbal tissue. Uh, I mean, with cadaver, you can get lots of tissue, but living, if, you're, if you don't have access to tissue, then living related would not be unreasonable either. Although they, did, they didn't use this, I think they used mainly just cadaver tissue. Uh, and try to get some new cells. So basically the idea is you have to bring some viable cells to the surface and, <clears throat> and help repopulate itself, at least get a state, get some epithelium to grow over the, and you know that corne that epithelium is gonna get rejected, the tissue is gonna get rejected, but just buys you some time so the tissue doesn't melt. So, um, so this, this I think is one good idea. Uh, or also I've heard uh, Dr. Dua talk about taking a, a free conjunctival graft from the other eye to put it over the, to put it over the cornea. That's not unreasonable. Again, some patients may not be open to touching their other eye if it's, uh, if it's available in the unilateral disease. But this allosleft you can do. And, and so I would never do an auto slept in an acute setting. That's bound to fail. No, none of these limbal procedures should be done in the acute hot eye. I mean, those are bound to fail. And I've seen that for sure. And many patients done elsewhere. Uh, so another idea, I'm just gonna, just throwing out ideas. This hasn't been really published, but again, um, I think it's worth trying for some of you who want to think about it. Again, in the very severe grade four injuries, if you want to try it, taking some or their own oral mucosa and using a slit-like technique, if you can get those tissues to adhere. Um, and then really this, this mesenchymal stem cells is really an area that we're actively looking at and potentially starting a clinical trial and already um, Sion Basu and those people and some people elsewhere are already 
working with these and putting them on the eye, and I think these are very exciting. So, uh, and these are my uh, acknowledgments. I want to thank uh, Dr. Mehdi Slani, who helped with the slide preparation, as well as my grant funding, uh, with some of the research that I do. This is my email. Definitely email me with questions later on. I mean, we'll, we'll go through some questions now, but um, feel free to email me with any sort of patient-related questions uh, in the future if I can help. Okay, so now. So Dr. Jalilian, you could just stop sharing your screen and then open up the Q&A box. We have uh, five questions. Okay. All right, so, uh, so her first question is asking, is there any difference in the management of the chemical agent as powder, gas, or liquid? Um, and, um, and no, not really. Uh, but the main, thing, the main thing to remember with things like powder, you really have, uh, you're gonna have particulate matter, so you really have to be quite uh, vigilant and aggressive trying to find those residual particulate matter and, and get them off the surface. Um, but otherwise, you know, acutely really is there, I mean, both uh, chronically for sure, though no difference, but acutely they're pretty much the same. Okay, next question, how do we recognize necrotizing conjunctiva and when is the best time to do surgeries such as necrotomy and AMT for large corneal epithelial defects since we mentioned that we're supposed to wait until the eye acquired for surgery? Okay, good question. So now for, so uh, there are two different kinds of procedures here. One is the surface reconstruction procedures, which is what we do later on in the chronic phase to try to, and those are the ones that we want to delay if we can as much as possible to, for the eye to quiet down. That's surface reconstruction. But then also you have surface stabilization procedures, procedures that you have to do to stabilize the eye to prevent further loss of tissue, further damage. So those you can do in the acute set. No problem. You could do you can do AMT as early as a few days. I mean, after the injury, that's no problem. But the necrotomy, I I mean, I'd say again, I I wouldn't. I don't jump into it. I give it maybe a week or two just to see how this eye is going, where it's going. But probably usually sometime in those first, let's say, two weeks or so, because then if you're pretty. If you, it's pretty clear to you on exam that there's still there's quite a bit of necrotic tenons and subconjunctival tissue that you have to excise, then I think that in that first couple of weeks is the, probably the, the right time. You don't have to do it immediately. Um, but um, yeah, so that, I hope that answers that question. Okay. Okay, good, good. All right, so another question. How do you identify normal corneal limbus at the slit lamp? And can you please speak about your way of identifying limbal ischemia? Okay, great question. So normal limbus, uh, so again, and I don't know if I'll answer this question more generally and then more specific to this, uh, this presentation. So in general, so you have some normal limbal landmarks that you can look for, those palisades of vote, those are, uh, lines at the limbus that you probably all seen. Uh, but that's not, that's not, you don't see that all the way around the limbus. You don't see that 360 usually. So that's, but anytime you see it, that's a pretty good indication that you have, that you have a pretty normal limbus. So again, I often actually, I'm looking at this, this becomes important in the setting of a, I'm trying to, a patient that had a unilateral injury and I have to look at their other eye to make sure the limbus is completely healthy. So I would, again, something I neglected to mention here, if there's even partial injury to the other eye, I think you're better off not touching the other eye or, or at best, maybe you could take just that one, one clock hour really just for the, uh, for a slit like technique. But I'd be very, very careful about touching and the good eye of a patient that had had a previous limbal uh, injury, uh, so because you don't want to compromise and tip over that eye, so a standard kind of double autograft is definitely not something that I would do in that patient. Anyway, so um, so looking for limbal palisades of vote, looking for 
vessels at the limbus, if you see the superficial vessels, uh, the limbus coming out to the cornea, signed at that limbus, probably not, not as healthy. A staining pattern at that limbal area can be helpful, especially if conscious starting to grow over that area, you're gonna see that's a different staining pattern in that area. A normal limbus should stain just like the rest of the cornea. And in limbal ischemia, basically, how to identify it, basically just look for a white limbus. I mean, it's a limbus that's, uh, and we saw some examples of it. I mean, it's, you, you've, the vessels have died, you've, have been destroyed, so it's basically white. And sometimes these, if the whole eye is so white and quiet, the eye almost looks normal to us because we're just used to seeing a red, hot eye as part of a, a severe disease. But the most severe injuries, where there's total ischemia, actually the eye looks white because there's no vessels, nothing left. How can we measure IOP in a K-Pro patient? Okay, I'm going to the next question. Yeah, so that's a great question and it's a problem. And really, there's no good way on really are the best way. So one of our residents did a study a few years ago on basically using a, one of these handheld tonometers and try to measure it over the sclera and try to correlate that with the cornea-based IOP. And not a great correlation, but still gives you some sort of ballpark sort of numbers. But basically what we're down to, and that's what I do in every capo patient, is just feel it by fingers. You just have to do it um, by, by finger, and that's the only way we have available right now. Um, all right, next question. What is the indication of AMT early in the course of chemical burns? Yeah, so we talked about this, and really, I would say, you know, mm, In a grade two, grade three injury, if you're trying to get faster epithelialization and uh, you are, um, and you want to do everything possible, then I think it's reasonable to do an AMT. I would say in grade four, those most severe injuries where there's so much tissue loss and ischemia, really there that it does, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good because really that that membrane will last you a week or at most, a week or two, and that's still not enough for, for a surface to epithelialize. But I'd say uh, grade two, grade three injuries, it's reasonable to think about them. Uh, and here we have the, and it's easy for us just because we have access to these uh, uh, Procara, which are these, these are self-retaining membranes, which just look go in just like a contact lens. But again, the added advantage is not that great. It's not like you are really altering the course of the disease. I don't think anybody can, when you look at long-term outcomes, I don't think any, anyone has shown that AMT clearly changed the long-term outcomes, especially in the more severe injuries. In the, in the short term, for sure, I think in the milder injuries it helps, but long term probably you're not altering the course of the disease too much. I hope I that answer that question. It's really, it's tough to say. It's really since there are no, no good studies, so I think people have different opinions on this. But that I just told you my opinion. Okay, so what kind of medical? Okay, yeah, is there a role for AMT in large conjunctival epithelial defect only? Uh, in the setting of fornix reconstruction, yes, that's that's one of the most common places that I use AMT, uh, or is a large conjunctival epithelial defect after a fornix, trying to do a fornix reconstruction. Again, in a severe injury in the acute setting, again, you, you're gonna have total loss of the epithelium from the conjunctiva as well. Again, I, I don't think amniotic memory is gonna do a whole lot of good in that acute setting just because you put this tissue there a week later, it's gone. Still, there's no epithelium. There's, you're going to wait a long time for the epithelium to work its way from the fornix to start to come to the surface. Anyway, that, but that's the, the most severe injuries was total conjunctival epithelial defect as well. Uh, but other indications for AMT in general, where else do we use it? So most common place I use it is really is fornix reconstruction. Um, another good indication for it is um, acute Stevens Johnson syndrome. Well, that Clearly, I think there's good evidence to support that in that first week, for sure, um, in those severe cases. And then persistent epithelial defects, 
to help those heal as a, by putting a graft inside the defect area, uh, that, that also helps. So well, those are sort of my main indications. What kind of medical therapy can we use to secondary glaucoma? It's also the same with uh, non-chemical trauma etiology. Yeah, so medical therapy, I mean, drops, and you hate to use drops on these surfaces that are compromised already, but uh, oral agents, almost all of these patients will put on uh, cetazolamide or methazolamide when they have IOP issues, um, and then drops as much as necessary, obviously, to keep their pressure in a safe range, but once they're, if you're really maxed out on drops, uh, then really I, I'm pushing towards getting a glaucoma procedure just because it's going to be hard to rehabilitate their surfaces when they're on so many drops. So again, before you do any limbal transplant procedure on a patient that's on multiple drops, for sure they should have that done. Have a glaucoma procedure and get them off the drops as much as possible. Okay. What's the ideal time for bandage contrast lens or AOT after what are the signs to look for? So BCL, I mean, I'd say, uh, again, depending on your injury. So I mean, if you have, you have to start to, you have, there has to be some epithelium on the cornea or have some indication that the epithelium is healing. So again, it depends on the grade of injury. But if there's epithelium there, I would start pretty early. I mean, I'd say, I, I wouldn't do right away. I mean, I'd try to maybe let your steroids get in a little bit better just because I worry about having a bandaged lens there, maybe I'm not letting my steroids to penetrate. But I'd say after a week or so, when I really give them a good amount of steroids for that first week, then a BCL is reasonable. AMT, again, like we said earlier, it's, it's, it's up to you. I mean, if you're going to do it, probably that first week seems reasonable. Um, but if you're going to do it for its anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, but um, long term, I mean, for epithelial defects, anytime. But in that acute setting, probably I would say that first week or two is probably the best time if you're trying to get its anti-inflammatory effects. All right, can we use medroxyprogesterone? Um, I have not used it. And I mean, I know basically to, so it doesn't cause as much stromal melting. And um, it's reasonable. I mean, I think it's, um, it may, may have some advantages, but I'm not sure it, yeah, so since I don't have personal experience, I don't want to speculate too much, but let's just, just tell you, my guess is that it probably doesn't make much difference. It's not going to make a big difference. But you certainly want to hit them hard with intense steroids, potent steroids right that first week or two. But then then back, then this can be your second one after you switch from, uh, from prednisolone. Okay, what analgesic do you prefer after chemical burns? So... Um, so a cycloplegic agent, I, I think I didn't mention that, something like atropine that I think helps uh, once a day in that sort of acute setting. So interesting, you know, the most severe patients, the most severe chemical burns actually are not that, may not be that symptomatic because you've destroyed the nerves as well, uh, at least on the surface. But, um, but on the patients who still have some viable nerves and are feeling pain, uh, I mean, obviously, I wouldn't use anything topical, but um, if they want something oral agents for pain control, that's not unreasonable um, for that first week. But a cycloplegic agent certainly helps them as well. All right, seems like that was the last question that I got. So um, I want to wish you, okay, how about use of EDTA? One last question here. Okay, EDTA. For, I'm not sure, I guess for calcium chelation, yeah, I mean, that's not unreasonable um, uh, if, they have, if they end up with a lot of calcium on the surface. That's not, but again, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with it as a therapeutic agent to using as a drop, but EDTA for calcium chelation is a one-time sort of scrape the surface, get the epithelium off and apply EDTA. It's not unreasonable. Uh, but again, I worry about a stable surface. Um, that has a healthy epithelium, then you sort of de-epithelialize it. Now you it get a little unstable. What about paracentesis? So I don't do paracentesis, but I think that's not unreasonable. And I, so I don't have pers personal experience, so I'm not going to say much, but some people say you can top the AC and see what they, 
alkaline pH, but I just, that takes time to do all that. And I think I would actually, I'd rather just spend that time initially just irrigating the eye and trying to normalize the pH. But in a severe, severe injury that's already penetrated the eye, um, I guess it's not unreasonable. Uh, but that, that aqueous gets turned over pretty quickly. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have that much of a source of experience. So I, I guess I won't say much. Vitamin C, yes, so vitamin C, def definitely we give them. Again, I don't know the evidence, how much difference it makes, but it's a safe, readily available medication. Uh, I mean, as you know, it helps promote collagen synthesis, so it can help uh, reduce stromal melting, um, theoretically. Animal models, the big data animals supports it. Clinically, it's hard to know how much difference it's making, but that's not unusual. All right, so... I guess that brings us to the end. I want to thank all of you from around. Okay, I guess scleral melting happened with chemical burns. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, when you have necrotic sclera, they definitely can melt. Uh, and for sure, that's, um, that's a complication. So that, that's why sometimes bringing, sort of advancing some tenons tissue that's healthier from surrounding areas can help reduce that risk. So anti-collagenase agents. So really, the the so when when we talk about anti-collagenase, basically collagenase is a form of matrix metalloproteinase. So we talked about generally, so matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors we talked about. So and really the main one that we do use are the doxycycline or tetracycline class of drugs. And again, for sure, we use that in every patient with chemical injury. Um, and then other things, like I said, vitamin C helps promote collagen synthesis. Citrate probably has some anti-collagenolytic uh, activity. Um, it's not unreasonable. I, I think, again, these drugs, it's, uh, if they're readily available to you, I think yeah, there's no downside to it. But I don't think these, I, uh, I can't say that they are critical that you must under, no matter how, join find citrate somehow to use it for this patient. I don't think I don't think that it makes a big difference that you have to go out of your way to find it. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jalili. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lawrence uh, and CyberSight for this opportunity. And definitely, for those of you who have follow-up questions that you didn't get to here, feel free to email me, and I'll try to get back to you within a week or two. Um, Painkiller for oral. Okay, so I mean, I guess really you're, um, I, I, I know, so I haven't used it that much, but I think here you have to use something with some narcotic strength if they're really in pain and, and your typical pain medications, acetaminophen or the, your NSAIDs are not helping, so you have to go with something more um, stronger with, uh, with some narcotic strength for short term. Not unreasonable. All right. Very good. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks.